I'm Scott Al Miller, and this is my everyday life living in Leon, Nicaragua. We often have power outages here, and when we do, we think, ah, oh, this is so awful. It's so different than when we lived back wherever we're from, in our case, in Texas. It, it really hits home. We had one last night that went on for probably three hours, and it really impacted us, right? We weren't able to get ready to go out. It was hard to take showers. The kids were left with nothing to do in the evening, and we weren't able to really make plans for a lot of things, and I wasn't able to keep working as I would have hoped, and that really impacts us a little bit at least. However, we need to put it in some context, and then when I thought about it, well, we'll get to that right after the bump. So it's important with all these things to contextualize. Last night we were without power for about three hours, but that was limited just to our barrio, which is Sutiava, out here in the west of Leon. The city itself didn't lose power, just something happened in this remote area. We didn't have a storm or anything, so this was probably a transformer exploding or a tree coming down on a line, something of that nature, and the crews were out within 20 minutes at least, and they were working on it, possibly much sooner. That's just when we saw them. So it was a pretty isolated outage in a very poor indigenous community outside the main city, and we were out for about three hours. Now that impacts us here more than a lot of places because one, it was nighttime, so we had no lights whatsoever. Everything became very, very dark, and that's just kind of annoying. A lot of us depend on electric for water pressure. Here where I live, we use a pressurized tank. So that means that we use a pump, it fills the tank, it swells kind of like a really, really strong balloon. And then it doesn't need the pump and it, as it uh, shrinks, it pushes pressure into the house. So if we lose power for short periods of time, you don't notice at all. Your power could go on and off all the time and it would just stay pressurized and the house would just keep working. If, but it, I don't like how it works in general. For anyone who is interested, pressurized tanks means that while you're using uh, the tank, but it is not pressurized, uh, not pressurizing, it slowly decreases in pressure. So you're taking a shower and the and the pressure, it doesn't get low, but it does get lower and you feel the, the change. And especially here with suicide showers, the temperature of the water is dependent on the flow rate of the water. So the temperature of the water and the pressure change slowly as you're taking a shower. Then you hear a, a, the, the pump kick on and repressurize the tank. While the pump's running, it really produces a lot of pressure, like really fast. So you go from this slowly decreasing, the water gets hotter and hotter, less and less pressure, and then all of a sudden it just blasts out and it's much colder because it's coming really fast. So you have to adjust things and like, it's just, it's not great as a way to go. I wouldn't necessarily recommend pressurized tanks unless you're really struggling for space. But that's that's how we have now. What we had in our Lava Rio house is we had a large tank that it had to pump to use. So if the power was out, the pump wouldn't work, and the only way to get water would be to you know put a ladle in or something. We could do it in an emergency. You could put a bucket in, get some water, but it wasn't great. So the pressurized tank is definitely better than that. And we have a lot more space here as well, and we've learned a lot from having lived here. So depending on what you have changes how the water pressure works. The best case scenario is having a tower, which of course takes a lot more space. Uh, but with a tower, you use the pump to push the water up to the tower. The tower has relatively even pressure at all times. The pump is never pushing directly to uh, to your pipes. It's always just filling the tank. So it's always the, the weight of the water up in the tank coming down the pipes that provides the pressure. So it's pretty uniform all the time, no matter what's going on. So that's kind of the ideal. And if you have that, you have that entire tank to use when the power's out. So it all depends on how much water you need, how you want to deal with it, how long you anticipate the power being out, and so forth. Here, we rarely have an outage more than a few minutes, but we do have short outages from about five seconds to as much as three minutes, really commonly, several times a week, typically, but it's often, oh, power's out, and right back on, sometimes faster than we can say it. Uh, so that's, it's common to have these little tiny blips, but the repairs are so fast. We have redundant systems. So when, when it's because with the extreme heat, things will go all the time. So a transformer will go and it'll just flip over to another one. In the US, in Texas, we're used to there not being redundant systems, but the systems that they have are newer and not subject to the constant heat. So they have a tendency to blow less often, but when they do, it's a guaranteed outage of many hours, partially because the crews are much slower, they're coming from much farther away, they don't have redundant equipment and so forth. So here we find that normal outages, while more frequent, are 
insanely smaller. Instead of nine hours, it could be 90 seconds. I mean, it's a very different animal. So last night we had this outage of three hours, which is the longest we've had in quite some time. Once in a while we'll get one during the night and we don't really know how long it was. Uh, we only know that we wake up and like an air conditioner is turned off or a TV will have turned on. Sometimes that happens and we'll be like, oh, we must have lost power. But was it 30 seconds? Was it an hour? I don't know because I was asleep. So that, that does happen. Maybe we've had longer ones, but having a multi-hour outage is a very rare thing here. But most of us, for whatever reason, living in the tropics, we tend to have generators of some sort, whether it's a true generator or what they now call misleadingly as a generator, a battery. How is a battery a generator? It is the opposite of a generator, but that's what they're calling it now. It's amazing what you're allowed to do with marketing. You can just lie about anything, I swear. So we have this battery that they call a generator, and then people are going to start using that, right? Because you put it on a product, people are going to use it. They're going to say, that's what generator means now. And it's going to be the opposite. Then we don't have a word for generating power, only for storing it. Like that's seriously a problem. Anyway, so we have big batteries and we keep the house running, not the air conditioning and not the pumps, but my computer stayed on even at three hours. I don't need a real generator with fuel. My battery alone is enough to keep everything running throughout the day. So I never lost my computers, never lost my monitors, never lost our internet, anything like that. So, you know, we could charge phones, we could charge iPads, that we were good with. So we were able to be online and do basic things, but we couldn't use the televisions, we couldn't use the air conditioning. So it's, uh, and the house is dark, right? We don't power very many lights, only my office lights get powered by the, by the battery. But so that's the kind of outage, that little bit of effort. And we have all those amenities stay on and working. So the kids are able to do their Duolingo. They're able to watch Netflix. They're able to, you know, do their drawing or animations or work on YouTube and do school projects. All that's able to just keep right on going as if nothing had happened. So no big deal at all from that perspective. But the outage was long enough that it was very noticeable. So we were thinking about it last night. And as you drove through town, it was dark everywhere. So we're like, wow, this is a big outage. And then you think, wow, it's really annoying. But... Then I read the news and realize that my family in Houston, so this is important, I'm not cherry picking a location. I'm using, uh, when I talk about the outages we had before we moved here, I'm talking about our outages, our actual experience of living in the United States and not in the same place that my family lives in now. I'm talking about when I grew up in New York, I had more outages than I have here now. When we lived in Texas for many years, we had more outages in the weeks before we left Texas than we've had in the years that we've been in Nicaragua. Cumulative, more just in those weeks. The degree to which we had United States power outages compared to here is so dramatic it's impossible to describe just how much more outage there was. Now just recently we went through a major set of tropical storms. We had three major ones all come through Nicaragua all at once. So we got hit really hard. We had our century rain. We had more flooding than we've had any time recently. We didn't have super high winds, but we did have a lot of big storms. We did not have Hurricane Barrel, which some of you may be like, oh, is that what you got? No, we did not. We're much farther southwest than that. Uh, but we did have this epic amount of storms roll through. And there's a storm rolling through as I'm saying this. I didn't know, but the dark clouds just came up over the house. And uh, so during this time, we went through some really strong periods where we thought we might lose power. I had some videos where I was shown driving through the streets where it, the water was feet deep in the, in the upper streets of the city, not the lower streets where it flows down to, but in the upper streets where the water is coming from. Like, it was really bad flooding here in the city. And we didn't lose power, or we did, but for like, I think the longest was five minutes during all those storms. But around the same time, a few days ago, Houston was hit with the outskirts of the hurricane barrel system. And in that, millions of people, literally millions of people in Houston and the Houston area have been without power already for several days. And they're being projected that it's at least five more days before new, new power will be restored. Not only did they lose power, they also lost cell phones. They lost uh, uh, landline phones, they lost internet, everything, the entire infrastructure of the Houston area failed and has failed four days. Now, some of those things are back, some of them are not. I do know that my family is back online, but they don't have power. They're not going to have power anytime soon. And this is an important thing to compare and contrast. Here in Nicaragua, we took multiple really strong storms and had no noticeable impact. And I'm comparing over a large area here. And in Houston, specifically, if we were living back in Texas, we'd be with our family in Houston and their impact at the exact same time that we had a three hour outage, they're in a multi week outage. And at the time that we only lost power in an isolated area, we only lost it in a tiny barrio. 
right? It'd be like losing a single neighborhood somewhere in a town in the United States. It'd be like, ah, one, one transformer went, we got to replace that transformer. Can't prepare for everything, right? That is what we had going on here. We didn't lose internet. We didn't lose cell service, nothing like that. And we could easily drive down the street and get to power. It's not like in Houston where the people who are without power often can't get far enough to get to places with power. They, they can't call and find out where power is because they don't have working cell phones and internet. All those things are gone. That's really dramatically different how much every component of the American infrastructure in the Houston area has failed and how much warning they had about all of this. They knew that their infrastructure was not up to par. They've been talking about that since before we left to come down here. So three, four, five years ago, it was a major topic of discussion that Texas was not making a functional electrical system. And all their other systems, we've been talking about those not working that great as well. Not the cell phones, that's that's a new thing. And that's probably, if everything else goes, they're gonna go too, right? They're not they're not the base of the chain, they're, they're part way along. So when we're looking at a really, really rich city, a city that claims to be the energy capital of the world, this is America's number one spot. If anybody should be able to produce electricity and keep it running, it should be Houston. This is as good as America can project in its image of what it can do, and we're looking at weeks of outage. I have never heard a rumor of Nicaragua being without power for that amount of time since the invention of electricity to the home, right? I'm sure it has at some point, but this is, this is a completely insane difference in we thought a three hour outage limited to a neighborhood was dramatic, but then remembering that an entire region of millions of people in the United States is looking at weeks without all functional infrastructure. And also during that same time, when we lose power here, nobody needs to go find air conditioning. Nobody is dying from exposure. Nobody is impacted in this incredibly negative way. Yes, it's super inconvenient. You gotta go find a source for water. You gotta go figure out how you're gonna do this and that and the other thing. You gotta figure some stuff out, but everything is figure outable. But in Houston, they're looking at people actually dying because it is so hot. And so many people say, oh, I can't come to Nicaragua. It's so hot. Yet all over the United States, something like half the United States right now is hotter than any place in Nicaragua. These comparisons that people use, oh, Nicaragua is such a hot place. How are people determining this? Where are they comparing to? Yes, Seattle is probably just cooler all the time. But beyond a few isolated places like that, Nicaragua is not hotter. It's just hotter when you're evaluating it. These comparisons are big. Nicaragua, everyone's able to just stay home. Oh, the power's out? Just don't go jogging if it's really hot, if you really need air conditioning. But in Houston, they're setting up emergency cooling stations and good for them, they need to, but they need to have emergency cooling stations to keep people alive. People are traveling to other states. That is literally the equivalent to Nicaraguans going to Honduras or El Salvador or Costa Rica to get away from a power outage. Imagine if we said we had to do that. Of course, we will never have to do that. But imagine if that was what was in the news that people were doing. Uh, it's so hot, there's a heat wave and the electrical system failed and the internet failed and no one can work and no one can live and it's too hot and everyone's going to expire. So they're forced to move to the neighboring countries. That is the state of Texas right now today, as I'm making this video, that was the news this morning, that the cooling stations aren't significant enough. They have charging stations, so you can go and get in air conditioning and charge your phones. And the temperatures that they're cooling to are like they're trying to cool cooling stations to our normal air temperature in, in Nicaragua. Like this is crazy how rough it is up there. And I don't wanna belittle how tough this is for Houstonians, this is horrible. Right? This is what my family's going through. This is what they routinely go through. Now, why they stay there, I have no idea. Why they ever move there, I have no idea. The only reason that anyone would be there is because they have other family there. It's the only reason we ever went to Houston, right? We loved Dallas, but Houston, like the weather's completely different. The power system is completely different, but the power in, in Dallas was like this. We had weeks without power in Dallas. It was absolutely crazy. Things that we had never experienced anywhere else in the world. But in the US, I've had weeks without power in New York, weeks in Dallas, and now weeks in Houston for my family. It, this is all, and, and this is not the first time. This is not even un unheard of. This is just normal. It's become a course of events. It's planned for. And they're not taking any action about it because they just give up. Oh, we can't do what Nicaragua can do. We can't keep the power on like Nicaragua and like Mexico and like Guatemala and like Costa Rica and like Panama. All of these countries down here, we're not having these problems ever. 
right? <laughs> like it just doesn't come up. Yeah, isolated towns out in the hurricane belt, way out east, super, super, super small, really poor, basically just barrios on the ocean. Yes, yeah, sometimes we hear about tragic stuff happening out there because they're in harm's way, they're in the most dramatic spot. But the majority of Nicaragua, when people are talking about Nicaragua, the portion we're talking about, the part where people live, where the population is, the part that has been Nicaragua for hundreds of years, that portion never, ever, ever experiences issues anything like this. We don't have the heat. We're just not as hot as the U.S. That's just the way it is. We don't have to have emergency cooling. We don't have, we've never had a day without power. We've had long portions of days without power over the course of several years. We've never had a day without power. That is, no one would believe it. Here in Nicaragua, no one believes these news stories from the U.S. because it seems so implausible. How can North America have these kinds of problems when Central America does not? It, it doesn't seem plausible. It doesn't seem reasonable. And to be fair, it is not reasonable. There is no excuse why rich American cities like Houston can't provide power at least on par with poor barrios in Nicaragua. That's crazy. That is truly crazy. There is no reason someone should need to believe such a ridiculous story. That the news is reporting that Houston is without power for multiple days and is looking at many more days. That it lost its internet for days. These are not things that anyone anywhere in the world should need to believe. It is not plausible, and yet that's really what's happening. So when you're making comparisons to Nicaragua and you're worried about power, you're worried about uh, internet, you're worried about being able to work remotely, remember we staff positions from the U.S. into Nicaragua for reliability. I have companies that put their staff, their American staff, in Nicaragua because they stay online when their local infrastructure goes down. That is a real thing because the infrastructure here is so much more reliable. And when it does have problems, it's not tied to the U.S., right? So it's a different, happens at different times. So there's additional benefits. Plus, it's cheaper. Many benefits. But that is a real thing that companies do because the U.S. is so unreliable and so expensive. So when you're making these comparisons, when you're making these judgments about concerns about moving to a place like Nicaragua, don't just look at, does it have outages? Everyone has outages. Compare it to the United States or wherever you're coming from and say, do we have outages? How would we judge ourselves if we were considering it from the outside? If we had to tell people what our outages were like, how long we go, what, how, what information we have about repairs, how much we can anticipate that things will be fixed, what kind of investment it goes into making sure it doesn't happen again. If we had to disclose what was going on in our own country, would people think that we were living in the place that we didn't want to go to? When you're evaluating, if you're, for example, living in Houston and you're wondering if Nicaragua's for you, Instead of saying, I wonder if their power is good enough, you should be saying, how could it be worse? You're in the worst power location. So that is, it, it's important to have this context. I get so many questions about issues with the power in Nicaragua, but living here, we're always appalled by how bad it is everywhere else. No, it's not perfect here, but it's consistently really good. And because of the way we have outages, because they're common but short, we're able to mitigate them with batteries or, if you, if you want, real generators. Small things you have in your house can suffice because we don't need air conditioning to keep from dying. Like, yeah, it's inconvenient to lose your AC. And if you really care, you can power AC units. You don't need to. This isn't Houston. This isn't the U.S. This isn't Washington, D.C. This isn't Virginia. This isn't New York. You can live. Most people do here without air conditioning. So that's an important additional context that when you're looking at that safety, at that comfort, the level that you could get here compared to the majority of the United States is pretty extreme in an area where most people assume it's something they're going to give up to move to Nicaragua instead of being something that they're probably going to gain, gaining better infrastructure by coming to Nicaragua. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. Get down, ask your questions. Send in your video questions. I get very few of these, like barely any. And we've got all the information in the description every single episode. Love to put you guys on the show. And if you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That comes directly to me and helps support the work that we do here. I'll see you all tomorrow. And if you would be so kind, click on one of the videos that comes up on the screen, or if you don't see one of those or you don't like one of those, scroll down or find whatever YouTube is going to recommend and uh, go on with one of those.